We're here with Seth Stern, co-author of the new uh, Justice Brennan biography that's sweeping the nation. And uh, it's really, uh, you know, getting a lot of attention. I know you've been doing a lot of events for, for ACS. Um, so let's start with, uh, with the, with the uh, sort of question about uh, why is uh, Justice Brennan, who's been off the court for some time, and uh, certainly this court no longer reflects uh, uh, his ideals or, or his uh, judicial philosophy, um, and maybe this is the reason. Why are our people uh, so eager to to learn more about uh, about the great Justice Brennan? Well, it's really been something striking to me as I've started traveling and talking at law schools. How much uh, students are interested in Justice Brennan? It's a generation of students who were probably toddlers when Justice Brennan retired in 1990, and then he passed away in 1997. And yet they're very eager. To, to learn more about him. And I think part of that is there's, a, a, I think, a sense of nostalgia for a time when there were uh, more liberals on the court and a, and a passionate and persuasive liberal such as Justice Brennan who had so much success helping build majorities under Chief Justice Warren and then continued to have success under two more conservative successors in, in building majorities and getting in liberal outcomes and, and making compromises with more moderate justices. So could you discuss a little bit about the concept of a living constitution, the concept of judicial activism, and what Justice Brennan sort of really intended? Obviously he believed as much as anyone in the text of the Constitution. Well you mentioned timing and it just so happens that this is this month, October 2010, is the 25th anniversary of a very uh, remarkable debate that Justice Brennan engaged in with R President Reagan's then Attorney General, Edwin Meese. And Justice Brennan, who uh, believed in the notion of a living constitution, he didn't necessarily use those words, but he believed strongly that the constitution should be interpreted according to contemporary society, that its meaning wasn't fixed at the time of the nation's founding. And he engaged in this debate. Justice uh, Brennan had a speech. The first one was delivered by Meese, who uh, sort of endorsed originalism and then Brennan came along a couple months later with some sharp words suggesting that originalism was arrogance cloaked in humility and they, they went back and forth for more than a year in a series of speeches, never uh, shared a stage but really engaged each other in a, in a, in a remarkable public debate and it really uh, laid the, the, found, uh, the framework for sort of the, the debate that we're still having today. I think in the intervening years, in, in many senses, the Attorney General won that debate, at least as a matter of public relations. I think the public sort of has come to accept the notion that, that judges should act with restraint, that as Chief Justice Roberts said at his confirmation, judges should act as umpires, and that the living Constitution has taken on sort of a taint of uh, that it, it's really just liberals running amok reading their own preferences into the Constitution. And so I think you see today liberal scholars, uh, including some of the, the ACS's leading lights, trying to find a new way to talk about constitutional interpretation that doesn't have the taint of a living Constitution. And of course, it goes around, comes around. Now, of course, it's the conservatives who control the court who are being called judicial activists. And, uh, you know, whether they're originalists or otherwise in decisions like Citizens United. So what do you think, uh, did, you know, Justice Brennan would have, would have thought of uh, opinions like that and, and, uh, and uh, judicial interpretations such as that? Well, I don't, I don't, I try not to pretend that I can channel Justice Brennan or, 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 or tell anyone what he might have said about something that's happening today. But I think he would have seen it as part of that ongoing debate. He did believe very firmly in his interviews with my co-author, Steve Wormiel, that there was a pendulum, and the pendulum had swung his way, and by the end of his tenure, it was swinging towards the conservatives, uh, and now it uh, continues to do so under Chief Justice Roberts. But I think Justice Brennan took a long view, well beyond his, his tenure, his lifetime, and really believed that the pendulum would swim, swing back in his direction. It was a very jarring transition for him in the early, in the late 60s, early 1970s. The court went through a very sudden transformation. President Nixon had four nominations in the course of his first term, which is an amazing number. You consider Carter had none in four years. Uh, Bush and Clinton each had two in, in eight. So in, it's an amazing number, and there was this sense that 
uh, Nixon and Chief Justice Berger were going to recast the court in a conservative direction. Brennan certainly had that fear, and each term he was waiting for sort of the floodgates to open, and all that he felt he had accomplished under Chief Justice Warren to be washed away. Uh, and he expressed a, a good deal of frustration. There were some terms in particular. His dissents took a very caustic tone. He regretted it later. He felt like the moderates in the middle, like Powell and, and, and John Paul Stevens and Blackman, that it wasn't really productive to write that kind of caustic language. But it did get the better of him at times. But he also came to embrace the new role. He took more extreme positions on some issues like obscenity and the death penalty, more absolutist, that they're in, instead of trying to find uh, something in the middle. And uh, he became sort of the court's great dissenter. It wasn't a role that he wanted necessarily, unlike Douglas, Justice Douglas, who really felt like he had no one soul to worry about except his own. Brennan much preferred to be uh, building majorities rather than dissenting. But he, he took to that role and he also continued to have more uh, success than he ever could have expected in uh, building consensus. Uh, you mentioned the, in, in, the, in the course of the book, you mentioned a, uh, a uh, what was it, I guess intended to be a mock dissent written by a clerk, uh, and uh, Renan was uh, so upset at the decision that he ends up saying, yeah, send it in, use it, and, and they did. And they did, yeah. That term uh, in, the, in the 70s, there was a, a series of those kind of d the caustic uh, dissents, and uh, it's it's interesting. I think Justice Brennan, rather than tempering his clerks who were younger, more passionate, more emotional, as he had in the past, you've got the sense they were almost egging each other on, goading each other into stronger language. And even after Justice Brennan would regret sort of the tone of some of those, some of his later clerks in the late 70s said, yeah, he was still at it sometimes, and they felt they had to tone him down. So there was, the, there was this dynamic, sometimes it was the cl clerks egging him on, Sometimes it was him spicing up the language that his clerks might have written. What was your favorite aspect, uh, could be case-wise uh, or personality-wise, of Justice Brennan that you either knew or didn't know before, uh, before you started on this journey? Well, I think the, a, a central theme that we explore in the most fascinating contradiction with Justice Brennan is the contrast between the liberal justice and the rather conservative man, and we, we, we talk about that in several contexts. He was a champion of the free press who got infuriated by reporters. He wrote the key precedents that led, uh, uh, privacy precedents, and helped craft Roe v. Wade, the opinion written by uh, Justice Blackmun, and yet he was personally uncomfortable with abortion. The area where it was most striking and it seems to have gotten the most attention since the book came out is on women's rights. He wrote the key women's rights decisions of the 1970s and yet he refused to hire women clerks. And it's, in, it's the opposite of what the critique of liberal activism that a liberal judges read their personal preferences into the Constitution. At least with Justice Brennan you have to uh, draw a line between what his personal preferences white men or his pot and then you could say maybe his legal or philosophical preferences, but he certainly wasn't reading his personal predilections into the Constitution. Sure. So, going back to sort of where we started, which is the model that Justice Brennan today offers to lawyers, law students, liberals, progressives, what does he say to, to people today who believe in a Constitution that offers rights to uh, the less fortunate, and uh, or for that matter, that don't believe in that. You know, it was so interesting as I've, I've worked on finishing the book since President Obama took office, and so many liberal writers and thinkers and activists have sort of in, in, uh, cited him as the model for who they want chosen as a justice. Passionate, powerful, persuasive, and he was held up as this is who we need on the court to sort of counterbalance the, uh, the conservatives. And I don't know if, if, a, if a Justice Brennan was to join the court in the current moment, whether he, would have the, he or she would have the success that Justice Brennan enjoyed. Because so much of his success as a consensus builder depended on having uh, moderate justices in the middle who he could work with. They didn't necessarily agree with him in every case, and sometimes in the, in the case of Justice Powell they distrusted him and that he was planting seeds for, to exploit in the future and yet on a case-by-case -case basis he could work with them. And on the current court that's so ideologically fractured, you have four and four on each side and then Justice Kennedy in the middle sort of leaning conservative, 
it's, it's harder to imagine anyone, no matter how successful they may be as a consensus builder, could play that role. Thank you very much. You're welcome.